Whispers at the Ganga Ghat in, and other poems in English, Sunri Saki and Amaltas in Hindi. Her recent academic work, Reconstructing Devotion Through Narada Bhakti Sutra, came out in 2019 from DK Print World. She is an associate professor in the Department of English at the Al Singh Evening College, the University of Delhi. Her interests have converged on the Agamic texts of Kashmiri Shaivism. Currently, she's a fellow here at the Institute. She's also associated with the Bihar she, School of Yoga. She, she. I said she. Yeah. Is associated with the Bihar School of Yoga in Munger and is a dedicated follower of the tradition. Alka, would you like to begin with that yes. introduction? Are you going to use this? Yes. Okay. Japu Jalpa Shilpam Sakalama Pimudra Virachanam Gati Pradakshinyam Brahmana Mashanadya Huti Vidhi Pranamaha Samveshaha Sukhama Kila Matmar Panadrisha Saparya Paryayas Tava Bhavatu Yanme Vilasitam Namaskar friends. So this presentation is on Bhairava. My major work is on Bhairava and Bhavana. But I have covered the Bhairava part in the last few months and Bhavana and Bhairava will be considered next year. So I have worked on two chapters. The first chapter is basically how the ancient Shaiva Tantras come up to the Trika, Trika Tantras uh, up to the 9th century. And after the 9th century, when Abhinava Gupta and before him, three more uh, of Shaiva Acharyas from Kashmir, beginning with Somananda and Utpaladeva, then these, uh, these Acharyas developed a special system of philosophy which is now famous as Trika, Trika Darshan and uh, Pratibhigya Darshan. So I, because there is very little time, uh, so I cannot present both the chapters. So I have worked uh, a sketch for the first chapter which uh, I will share on this slide. Um, I hope this is visible. Um, so the uh, these traditions are certainly from the antiquity and we cannot actually locate historical uh, dates. Uh, yet, uh, the first location uh, of the uh, historical data comes from the, uh, the ascetics 
who uh, kind of you know walked away to the periphery and they are they belong to what is called ati marg because they transcended the varnashrama so they were also called atya ashramis so the ati marg then uh, went into two um, systems one was pashupata which is the most ancient uh, pashupata shaivas and from the pashupata pashupatas were uh, actually uh, complete uh, ascetics they from they them uh, they, there was an offshoot which was called lakulas so the lakulas uh, were kind of more extreme and uh, they were called maha pashupata vratins they uh, challenged all notions of purity and impurity of the vedic uh, systems but from the ati marga later there came the mantra marga uh, the difference between the two was that in ati marga the only uh, paramarth the only purpose was to was to gain moksha but in the mantra marga the mokshas as well as siddhis were the purpose for the initiate so mantra marga then further goes into shaiva siddhantas uh, and bhairavagamas actually these are all um, considered together in the trika by acharya abhinav gupt but uh, it is mainly from the bhairava agamas that trika darshans um, evolve further so the difference between bhairava agamas and shaiva siddhantins uh, was generally like in shaiva siddhantins there were no female uh, deities and the presiding deity is sada shiva uh, the the scriptural uh, foundations for shaiva siddhantins were the uh, 10 shaiva agamas and 18 rudra agamas these were these are different in the sense that uh, the rudragamas were dual non dual and shaivagamas are dual uh, systems while the bhairavagamas from which as i said the trikas evolved later uh, these are 64 bhairavagamas and they are completely non dual so their tendencies are non dual but uh, they are uh, refined into uh, complete non dualism only under the work of exegetical work of the uh, kashmir shaiva uh, shaiva acharyas between 9th and 11th mainly and 9th and 13th centuries uh, we go so we are we are you know our focus is or our concern is with the bhairava agamas which then uh, you know the, these uh, branches uh, are important for us because uh, acharya abhinav gupt uh, subsumes the uh, material from all these bhairavagamas when he evolves his trikakula or anuttara trikakula even so uh, i'll quickly look at these branches from bhairavagamas we get mantra peetha and vidya peetha uh, mantra peetha here the presiding deity is uh, swachhanda bhairava and uh, vidya peethas are the yogini cults so swachhanda bhairava mantra peethas are basically you know more masculine uh, dominant uh, uh, agamas while in the vidya peeth we see lots of yogini cults and the feminine takes ascendance um, so in vidya peetha tantras where the yogini cults uh, prevail um, we also have bhairavas of uh, by all means uh, there are bhairavas of different um with different characteristics in vidya peethas also the manthana bhairava the manthan bhairava is the uh, kind of you know is the gananayaka who uh, leads these yog- hordes of yoginis from vidya vidya peetha is important for us because because kashmir shaiv darshan you know um although you know it is famous as shaiva darshan you will see that um the 
within the lineage you know the guarded lineage it is a shakta tradition and it is admitted in the shastras also so vidya peethas are basically shakti tantras um then uh, there are kali cults in this and uh, the, there are uh, kali cults and trika tantras uh, these trika tantras again become important for us because uh, the scriptures uh, of the or the the, the 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 tantras that are found uh, in the trika uh, tradition are later serve as the uh, base for the trikakula or anuttar trikakula which uh, acharya abhinav gupt develops uh, just to uh, just to share with you that you know within trika there are this famous kala and krama and mata systems so uh, kalism is uh, famous for its you know these erotic worship um, but everything has been uh, transformed uh, philosophically and has been exposited philosophically by the uh, acharyas which i just named so uh, it is uh, the the panchmakar sadhana which is a part of the kula system uh, made it infamous but acharya again brings it to a more uh, accessible and acceptable um, system Uh, so that later the grahasthas also adopted the kulachar so i need not yeah about the kali cults i would like to say that you know the uh, kalasam karshini and uh, um kalasam karshini and then uh, you know the tripura sundari these were the later um kind of evolutes which were highly uh, highly revered even within the kashmir uh, shaiva uh, practices uh, sadhana practices so right now i will stop here and uh, take on the yeah you can have a look at it or you can you know to me if you are interested in these uh, traditions we move on to my second and uh, more important chapter which is which focuses on uh, yes which focuses on the bhairava consciousness and how the you know the from the uh, ancient in the ancient tantras how the bhairava is uh, presented as a deity and uh, with various characteristics of uh, of course now this is the famous uh, kala bhairava there are numerous innumerable bhairavas actually so we will see how uh, now this is a good representation here in this picture you see this uh, kapaladhari and trishuladhari bhairava with the and next is next to it is a, a sculpture i'm just showing you the various you know famous forms so uh, my journey in this chapter is to you know come from the this kind of bhairava with you know multiple characteristics and uh, dimensions associated with it uh, as a deity uh, how we subsume it into the individual um, being or how we superimpose the whole all the characteristics of the deity on to the individual self so this is the self who is kind of you know actually the bhairava who is superimposed on the individual body and then you know this uh, symbolic of the consciousness where the shaktis are imagined on the on the body of the self which is a bhairava self so uh, i will i'll be actually reading out from my second chapter which is and in my effort to be concise uh, i may look a little bit 
incoherent if you don't find the connections of course i'm here you can please come back to me and uh, ask me so the second chapter is about hermeneutics of bhairava in which i look at the distinction as it is conceived um, about bhairava and para bhairava and uh, later the three in the three texts that i have chosen to expose the concept these are um, bhairava and vigyana bhairava tantra shiva sutras and the tantra lok um, i must uh, i must share with you that i am actually working only within the tradition because uh, that is the focus how it is conceived and slowly subsumed into the individual consciousness so from the journey is from this external manifest world to the individual consciousness how everything is connected in bhairava consciousness so uh, the term bhairava is used to denote the highest state that an empirical individual can experience it is also compared to the state of uh, liberation during the lifetime called jivana mukti and the term para bhairava on the other hand is used to denote a state beyond the bhairava state uh, and this cannot be conceived by an empirical individual so para bhairava is conceived as the supreme knower the para pramata who is the knower of all and that's why it cannot become the object of uh, knowledge because who can know the knower of all as trikarahasya puts it so the para bhairava cannot uh, be the subject of any exploration also hence our uh, exploration in this thesis is also bhairava state and acharya abhinav gupta also says uh, uh, that para bhairava is so subtle that it cannot be brought into the realm of empirical perception i come to the text that i have chosen so bhairava with reference to vigyana bhairava shiva sutras and the tantra lok um in order to understand the hermeneutics of uh, bhairava in the absolute non dual trika shiva tradition i have chosen three texts vigyana bhairava shiva sutras and tantra loka from the tradition the vigyana bhairava is an ancient shiva agama which represents the extensive continuity of shiva tantric traditions and predates uh, kashmir shiva exegesis vigyana bhairava is is also not a very uh, is not also not a purely non dual text because there are elements of dualism therefore one can read it as a precursor to the absolute non dualism of kashmir um the attempt at integration of dualism into non dualism uh, is clearly seen in the questions that goddess puts and the answers that bhairava gives uh, in the vigyana bhairava tantra itself the shiva sutras is the entry text for non dual trika shaivism of kashmir and this text this text gives us uh, the uh, with the subsequent stage provides us the subsequent stage in the development of the concept of uh, great non dualism which is uh, famous as maha advayavad of kashmir shiva sutras hold on to the term bhairava to denote the supreme consciousness and it totally subsumes all kinds of imagery associated with the bhairava as a deity or deities and integrates the bhairava appellations into the metaphysics of kashmir shaivism the third text that i have chosen for exposition of the idea of bhairava is the tantra lok the tantra lok is the culmination of the whole exegetical process of non dual philosophy of trika shaivism which was accomplished through the line of kashmiri acharyas uh, that i named before somananda acharya utpala deva and abhinav gupta and also his, his later disciple kshemaraj besides the histor besides 
besides the way these texts uh, subsume bhairava uh, their historical placement also allows for a clear exposition of the transformation from the proliferated tantric literature along with their equally proliferated esoteric practices into consolidated spiritual philosophical discipline of non dualism developed by the kashmir shaivacharyas and within this framework we will see the emergence of an um, purely non dual philosophical exposition the vigyan bhairava tantra although it was first documented uh, in the beginning of 8th century is considered to be a part of the bhairava tantras and it was continually received through oral transmissions um this text gives us a glimpse into the metaphysics and yoga of the supreme reality which prevailed before the shaping up of absolute non-dual trika shaivism in this text we find mention of exoteric aspects like worship yagnas rituals along with the elucidation of esoteric other esoteric aspects however a significant change of perspective starts with the revelation of shiva sutras in the beginning of the 9th century in the shiva sutras both the aspects the external and the internal the exoteric and the esoteric are exposited as one reality within the supreme i consciousness the shiva sutra text completely moves away from all external rituals rites and worship so that the very reality or being is defined as consciousness itself in this regard these aphorisms of shiva are very sophisticated exposition of the supreme consciousness the text of the shiva sutras describes the supreme consciousness from three perspectives the subtle state subtle state and the state gross awareness and it offers three kinds of corresponding means or upayas to experience that supreme i consciousness which is an unchanged existence sat the tantra lok moves away a step further and exhibits a unique exposition of this unified principle of supreme consciousness where the whole web of diversity the shakti is responsible for that diversity along with the elucidation of tantric modalities to access the high allows us to access the higher realms and it enumerates analyzes and eventually places uh, this uh, web of diversity into the substratum of supreme i consciousness alone to the particular texts um how they are looking at uh, bhairava and how the etymology that is um that this term uh, from where this term derives how the etymology is uh, conceptualized and explained in the three texts and with what differences so first like concept of bhairava as well as bhairava state in the vigyan bhairava tantra we will talk about the vigyan bhairava tantra which is a bhairava agama that is a revealed scriptural discipline is dedicated to reveal non dual nature of supreme consciousness conceived as bhairava the title vigyan bhairava juxtaposes vigyana vignana and bhairava the word vignana in the title is significant and it serves to lead the externally perceivable uh, imagery associated with bhairava into the unified subjective consciousness which is vignana 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 is cognitive activity of consciousness It is also supreme consciousness here. It's one of the important critics or ex-scholars, Professor Dean Pandit. It is an important text, Kashmir Shaivism, 
uh, he explains this uh, particularly in this context, in the context of Vijnana Kairava. He says that Vijnana, in this description, uh, represents the Siddhanta or the Jnana part, the knowledge part, and uh, uh, sorry, the, the whole text actually represents uh, two parts, Vijnana and um, that is Siddhanta and the Prayoga, the, the principles and the practice part. Uh, and he also says that it is only after the Siddhanta, that is the knowledge aspect, has been experienced uh, through the Prayoga part, through the practice part, that Jnana becomes Vijnana. And this is emphasized in the entire exegesis of Kashmir Sharifism by the Acharyas that knowledge is very important. The knowledge of the Siddhanta is very important. The Shastra is very important for Jiva Mukti. So coming back to the Vijnana Bhairava, the word Vijnana is also equated with Bodha, that is pure awareness. And hence again connects with the consciousness. Thus, the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra inheres and indicates not only the Jnana of Bhairava, but also the experience of Bhairava within one's own consciousness. Hence, Bhairava is Vijnana Rupa, as Shemaraja calls it in his invocation verse in his commentary called Vijnana, Vijnana Yoga. So, in the process of conceptualization of the principle of supreme consciousness as Vijnana Bhairava, the Tantra performs two functions. Firstly, it connects the abstract part, that is the knowledge, Vijnana, to consciousness, as is reflected in the use of terms like Chida Bhairava, Bodha Bhairava, Vijnana Rupa, etc. And and secondly, it turns a concrete idea of God in the form of Bhairava into an overarching, uh, overarching abstraction. In fact, the Tantra also gives us image of popular forms of Bhairava as the one who bears the trident and keeps a cranium bowl in his hand. As Devji addresses him as Deva Deva Trishulanka Kapala Krita Bhushana in the, in the verse. When she addresses. However, this idea of Bhairava is that is widespread within the Hindu religious culture and which carries within the entire range of impersonations, that is, Bahu Rupas associated with the form of Bhairava, uh, which are used in idolatry, they get transformed into a subjective process happening within the consciousness. Within the Trika exegesis, this is achieved by delineating the etymological base of the word Bhairava into metaphysics of higher state of consciousness and by designating it as Bhairava. And although we witness this delineation most clearly in the Tantra Lok, we witness how the duality perceived in the manifest forms of divinity is recognized to be gross and non-duality perceived within the subjective consciousness is recognized to be pure essence of Bhairava in the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra also. This is demonstrated clearly in the first 23 verses and the later again and later again in the last 14 or so verses. The unbirth of uh, or the inherent meaning of the word Bhairava is one who makes everything resound with fear. However, its etymological base or vyutpatti uh, that contributes to the esoteric and mystical connotations appears in the text of Vijnana Bhairava Tantra as well as in the Tantra Lu. So, etymology of the word Bhairava is analyzed in two ways in these two texts. Um, Bhairava as consisting of the words Bhaya and Rava. Uh, before I go on, I must say that Bhairava is actually made up of Bhava, Rava, These three Varanas and they, they are uh, explained at great length in these three texts, uh, in, at least in Vijnana Bhairava and uh, the Tantra Yoga text, not so much in the Shiva Sutras. Uh, so, we will, I have covered all that in my work, 
uh, and uh, however you know now I'm looking at the uh, the selections from the text. Uh, so please keep that in mind as you understand Bhairava. So uh, the word Bhairava is considered as um, consisting of words Bhaya and Rava in the Vikram Bhairava Tantra and uh, in Tantra Loka it is analyzed as consisting of three syllables Bha, Ra and Va. We will discuss that in the context of Tantra Loka. Now, uh, as mentioned about the Vigyan Bhairava Tantra uh, in verse 130 uh, describes the etymology of Bhairava in two phrases, Bhaya, literally fear, and Rava, literally resound. So the Tantra in this verse ex explicates, uh, let me read out the verse for you so that uh, it will be easy. Bhaya Sarvam Ravayati Tarpada Vyapako Akhile this is also a technique, but for us, the first line is important. Bhairat Sarvam Ravayati. So, Bhairava is the one who makes. Uh, yeah, I am coming. This is what I am doing now um, in the next book. These were the words that I was. So, Bhairava um, is the one who makes all creatures resound with Bhaya and in doing so pervades the entire universe. This is the translation of the first line. Bhaya Sarvam Ravayati Sarvada Vyapaku Akhile. The one who makes all creatures resound with fear and doing so pervades the entire universe. Hence, the Tantra clearly reflects an image of a terrible deity which in turn reflects an element of duality as marked by uh, many scholars. However, when Kant challenged that, the general intention of the Tantra is to reveal Bhairava as non-dual supreme consciousness alone. This is accomplished not only within the verses of the Tantra, but also by the commentators on the Tantra, especially, especially Shemaraja. As we shall see, Shemaraja turns around the whole theological etymology of Bhairava as a terrifying deity into a mystical entity at the in the very first phrase of his invocation verse in his commentary on the text. He brings the subjectivity and cognition aspect of the supreme being, the Bhairava, into the center. And I read out from this text, uh, this no internet here. Um, I should. What do? Move on. Move on. Uh, if you can see this verse, this is the invocation ver verse which I'm going to read out now. Um, and we. That's the verse. Yeah. All but I thought. Bhiru naam abhaya prado bhava bhaya trandasya hetu stato. Tridhami pratitashya bhira varucham isho antrasyantaka. Bhiram vayatiya suyogini suyogini vahas tasya apur bhairao. Vishwasmin bharanati prada vijayate vijyana roopa. So victory to that supreme Parabhairava who is of the form of consciousness, Vigyana Rupaha, who grants fearlessness, Abhaya Pradaha, to those who are fearful of the afflictions of the world, Bhiruna, who being the cause of their cry of despair and for that reason reveals himself in the abode of their heart, Pratitashya, 
do fill their hearts with fearlessness. पीपल हु आर अफ्रीज who are in fear who are crying fear and and rama is the cry bhi avarucham but uh, i think it is bhi varucham yes bhi rava Rucham. Sorry, I would like to. Oh yes, yes. Bhi, bhi Rava. Okay. Um. Where was I? Experiencing the sound of fear or something like that. Yes. Right. So where was I? Yes. He, who is the destroyer of the death itself antakasyantakaha who is the master of such yogins who can consume the time and who nourishes this world vishwasmin bharnadi krita with such attributes victor victory to that supreme parabhairava here we witness a clear modification in the imagery associated with khairava as a deity who terrifies all beings of the original text into images of Bhairava, not only as a benign form, but also into a Bhairava, which is of the form of consciousness. It's We see how Sri Maharaja establishes consciousness aspect at the center and projects the idea that this Bhairava is a unified consciousness that pervades the world, world and also lives in the heart of every being so transcendence and immanence his invocation shows bhairava as a sustaining principle of the universe because it is one who nourishes because it is the destroyer um, of the universe because he is the ender of the death itself and it is the cause of samsara because it causes the cry of the people caught up in the world We must note that Sri Maharaja's commentary was written after Trika exegesis by Acharya. Uh, Trika exegesis was culminated, uh, had already culminated into a fully developed non-dual philosophical system. As Sri Maharaja interprets the Tantra from absolute non-dual perspective and in complete accordance with the uh, Trika philosophy. So the Bhairava is projected as immanent as well as transcendent being. It is immanent as it is present in the activities of the world, and it is transcendent as it is the principle of supreme consciousness and cause and source of the universe itself. Coming back to the verse Mantvati, Bhairava Sarvamantavati, which gives us the etymology, we see that Jayadev was saying. Uh, also, who was also from the lineage of uh, Shami Lakshmanju Maharaj, he also translated this verse. Complete background knowledge of the Trika <coughs> of the Trika as it developed between 9th and 13th centuries. So, uh, Jayadev was saying uses a vocabulary and discourse that is used in the Shiva Sutras to describe Bhairava and almost forgoes the denotations of the original text of the Vigyana Bhairava Tantra. Thus, uh, he emphasizes only on the metaphysical and philosophical meaning of the word Bhairava as it is received in the absolute beauty, non dual Trika tradition. He highlights uh, her luminous consciousness. Um, um of bhairava by emphasizing on the uh, root bhav means light and it relates it to light of consciousness which is bhairava 
Similarly, like another. Then I would like to thank the gurus, Swami Satyananda, Swami Niranjanananda, and my dear guru, Swami Satyasanga Nanda Saraswati, whom we know as Swami Satsangi, and she is the one who uh, has written a commentary on Vijnana Bhairav Tantra, which led me into this uh, this whole tradition. I would like to also thank Swami Lakshman Ji Maharaj, pay my uh, respects to him. Then I would like to thank Professor Navjivan Rastogi, the great scholar and a great mind and a beautiful human being, Professor Rastogi, whose work, who is very famous in this field. Then Professor Bettina Sharda Boimer, whose work I always consult and I have done workshop with her, study workshop with her on Vidyana Bhairav and Pratipitya Hridayam and many and Netra Tantra. And I would like to thank Professor Mark Dixkowski and uh, who is a, again an extremely great scholar and sadhak in the lineage with whom I'm still studying the Tantra Lok. Then I would like to thank my Sanskrit teacher um, who is a sannyasin in Rishikesh, Harsha Vardhan. And finally, thanks to my mother and Raj Tyagi. Uh, who, we, who was widowed at a very young age and had raised five children. I'm the eldest. And I would like to thank my daughters, Lavanya Tyagi and Sanya Tyagi, who always support me in my work. And most of the times, they also uh, emotionally support me, although I should be supporting them. So thanks uh, to everybody. Thank you very much. minutes before the uh, second meeting runs out. So if someone who is not present in the hall now would like to ask a question, someone who's connected by video, uh, let's give them priority. Anybody like to ask a question? Well, I have a slightly off-topic question. Alkati, can you hear me? Ji, uh, namaste, sir. I can hear you, namaste. sir. Pleasure to see right. you, sir. Uh, I have a little off-topic question. You spoke such a lot about Bhaira, and it's in the, I suppose, in the uh, Kashmir Shaiwai tradition, but nothing at all about Kali. I am very interested in Kali on account of time, and we are just past the Shera. So can you say something about uh, why Kali is missing in Kashmir Shaivism? Thank you, sir, for asking this question. Uh, sir, um, I was thinking about you when I was studying Chapter 6 with uh, Mark G. Uh, Kali is a guhiya tattva. So, you know, Acharya says that uh, na... Uh, so he, he can... Not hidden. Right. That, uh, he says, Acharya says that na khyatam nirbhajya yato ati rahasyakam. I will not explain it. Um, I will not reveal it. Uh, like nirbhajya uh, means bhag bhag karke. I will not. I will not explain it uh, properly because ati rahasya kam. Uh, however, sir, Kali, 12 Kalis, because Acharya has integrated Krama as well as Kula. So in, in Kula, uh, we have these 12 Kalis and Kal Sankarshini transcends these even these 12 Kalis. This is called the Anakya Tattva. Actually, Kali is supreme, sir, here in this villa. As I said in the beginning, it is not Shaiva. It is a Shakta tradition, but that is kept under uh, like, you know, when you go get initiation, then you come to know about it. But chapter 6 of Tantra Loka, sir, uh, Kala is described um, at length so that the whole, you know, this uh, as, uh, astronomical um, uh, description of the universe, uh, the nakshatras, the cycles of moon, the cycles of earth, the cycles of sun, all, all of them are integrated in the span of the yogi's breath. 
and you would be so happy to uh, read how the lunar calendar is integrated here in the span of one breath from heart to the uh, inner dwada shanta to the external dwada shanta i would be so happy to discuss it with you sir at length uh, so you lunar calendar not lunar calendar sorry which one, what did you say i said it is uni solar calendar never the lunar calendar lunar okay. calendar is only the sun theek hai sir so are you saying that kali is the destroyer of time or the master of time mistress of time kali does the kalana kali is responsible for ta- time there is no time in supreme consciousness this is called krama the mm-hmm. sequence arises when the universe becomes manifest and kali that way manifests the time I and see. when time comes then universe comes i see so she's the creator of she is everything <laughs> she does the kalana she is also mm-hmm. the spandan mm-hmm. uh-huh. so okay Because you also describe Shiva as the Antakasya of Bhairava, as the Antakasya Antaka, that is the the ender yes, of the, end. the ender. Time is the ender, and the ender of the ender would be the master of time. Who mm. comes time? Yes. So, uh, if you are asking, what is the difference between Bhairava and Kali? there is actually no difference because it is like he works through the shakti so sometimes i see you sometimes i see uh, your power which manifests in your in your activity so if you are focusing on the action then it is the shakti on which you are focusing but if you are focusing on the holder of the shakti then you are all the time talking about shiva so shiva is the uh, shiva shiva is shakti because if i see chehal sahab i can understand him only through his actions how much power he has without actions we do he is jada so shiva is jada if the sh- he doesn't have shakti But of course he has shakti shiv shakti we need a longer display Actually, I am. I am. Yeah. In the field. Should we let uh, Julinda? You know, if there's another question from those who are listening by uh, video conference, can we take their comments and questions first? Because I think we only have about five minutes left for them to answer. Anybody? Online. Yeah. Any anyone online? If not, then we'll take a question from the from the room. Yes, do you have a question? I already asked first. <laughs> yeah. Well, why why congratulating you, Akash, for the uh, wonderful presentation? Uh, I would I would I would confess that being an artist and a role known religious man, uh, this is. Uh, Topic because this uh, is really not very much of use to me. And in any case, uh, actually, I am very much I am much interested in the scientific part of this presentation. Now uh, your 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 history as of that. You you have referred to Osho uh, in your in your presentation, and I have also read a commentary on the Gyan Bhairava. In my earlier days, I have, <laughs> uh, I think, like many of us, I read Osho at a time when I was, uh, you know, What? in my. What's your life. question? Put yeah. your question, please. Yeah. So uh, Osho has commented that this book uh, neither uh, could be called uh, intellectual, nor could it be interpreted as a philosophical work. It is a scientific work. He he observed. So. Could not understand even also till today. If it's really a scientific work, uh, which scientific methods have been suggested uh, in this work, and how would you call them scientific? Will you go? Thank you, sir. It's uh, I think it's a very good question which I could not cover. Um, scientific if you consider because you study human body as a science and breath is a part of your body so in most of the techniques that this bhairava talks about 
are about the breath and observation of the breath in the tantric philosophy is the most important yoga is the ultimate yoga so the very first verse urdhve prano hrido ji uh, uh, urdhve urdhvo uh, do you remember this verse <coughs> urdhvo prane hrida jivah um, the ji the individual all the time is uh, connected to through the cosmic prana with its own breath jab when they when we inhale when we inhale we are inhaling the energy the vital energy from the cosmic uh, environment and when we are exhaling we are being nourished by that by that energy which we had have inhaled it's as simple like you know agar aapko if you want to take it as scientific your uh, your heart your heart when you inhale the oxygen from the uh, from the inhalation uh, goes into your heart and purifies your heart purifies uh, your blood through that but that's the scientific part the consciousness part is that when you focus on the breath the mental constructs because here the focus is on going beyond the mind all the time so thought constructs have to be transcended that is the focus for the yogi and that can be done only by observing the breath and things start revealing the energy goes into the hidden chakras automatically it start hitting the chakras inside your body but that is the mystical aspect because we don't recognize the chakras in the science yes we are done with more method method is breath by him this book this book gives 112 techniques so the first technique i gave you as an example which is which is directly about the breath but you know the, you can use the, the one of the practices for instance is you do a pin prick and focus on that sensation and you can your your awareness can quickly lift you can observe pain you can observe joy with full focus if you can observe your you can go beyond mind in pain also we go beyond mind in joy also we go beyond mind so the tantra is using all these techniques of observing the things which are in between which can lead you to the nirvikalpa state these are the techniques we can let me try one is enough bhairava says one is enough bhairava says out of these 112 if only one is taken you can feel let me just comment that in the in the past couple of centuries the term science is has been limited to uh material science but uh but it's not necessarily the case that everything in the universe is material and just because the methods of modern science are limited in that they can only act through the the senses and the the in, in specific objects and so forth but that doesn't mean that everything in the world is is possible to be known by those methods so a scientific text may claim to be scientific because it is using internal or uh, mental methods and those methods transcend the physical and and this is not something to be considered lightly now because you know in these days uh physicists have discovered what's called dark matter and dark matter makes up about 80 to 90% of the entire mass of the universe and that dark matter is called dark matter because we don't know anything about it it's beyond light and it's beyond anything that can be seen or known by any any kind of measurement whatsoever right now and uh and so when when 80 to 90% of the mass of the universe is, is unknown and it's let's just say it's it's extremely arrogant of science material science to claim that some things are not science that are outside of that so there may be knowledge in these tantric traditions and in the uh, various texts starting from the uh, Vedic and Upanishadic texts which now may be dismissed as being religious 
but are actually not religious. Actually, it's they're dealing with something which is real, but but it's outside of the material world, and we just don't know it. So uh, the text may be giving us some insight into those things. So let's. Uh, I say just wait to me in a moment. Yeah, so, I would. Yeah. Dark matter is not about failure of science, it's about failure of Newtonian gravitation. And I'm working on that, it's about bringing all sorts of things related to dark matter. It's a hypothesis which I personally reject. So let's not bring in stuff like dark matter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, dark matter. I must confess, sir, I didn't understand you, uh, but I was reminded of two things by lis listening to your lecture. Uh, I was reminded of my uh, studies in philosophy of science, and I'm reminded of my studies about politics a little bit, because uh, I'm poet by instinct and political scientist by training. <laughs> uh, in philosophy of science, uh, the, there are, you know, in conceptualization and theorization, uh, two terms are mentioned, observation terms and theoretical terms. Observation terms are those concrete objects which can be directly observed, directly uh, felt, directly touched, and uh, directly or concretely studied. Theoretical terms are those terms which, which are beyond observation terms and uh, they are operationalized through empirical indicators. Empirical indicators operationalize those terms. Like uh, democracy is operationalized by in empirical indicators like independence of judiciary, free press, and things like that. And democracy is much beyond that. Democracy as a theory is an abstract object, an abstract entity that can only be partially operationalized through some concrete observation terms. So this is one real problem. Uh, another, you have repeatedly mentioned Abhinav Gupta. Is this the same uh, yes. uh, uh, Kashmiri Pandit who yes. has written uh, Dhanyalo? Yes, Lochan. Uh, now, in Abhinav Gupta says that the rhetoric, uh, the the theoreticians of rhetoric of poetics, they say that Alankar is the spirit of poetry. This is nonsense. Alankar is not the rhetoric of poetry. Dhani is the rhetoric of poetry. Mm. Mm. Suggestiveness. Mm. Uh, you know, Alankar is a painted window that obstructs your vision. Uh, whereas uh, Dhani is an open uh, window that doesn't obstruct and uh, suggests uh, you know, meanings beyond meanings. Meanings beyond meanings. So these are the two things that came to my mind. Listening to you, I, I couldn't understand it. I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's yes. my failure, sir. Yeah. My total failure. <laughs> I जो वर्ण और फिर वर्ण वर्णों से अक्षर और अक्षरों से वाक्य और वाक्यों से विचारों की सीक्वेंसेस Uh, वो कहते हैं कि सबकी व्युत्पत्ति उस स्पंदन में ही है अब जब सब कुछ वहीं से आ रहा है आपकी जहां तक पहुंच चली जाए आप उसको समेटते रहिए भाषा सर्वोपरि नहीं हो रही है क्या अध्यात्म दिखाई नहीं पड़ रहा है कहीं नहीं सर यही अध्यात्म है कि जब आप उसकी शक्ति को स्पंदन की शक्ति को जान जाएंगे तो आप खाली थॉट्स में नहीं अटके रहेंगे हाँ भाषा को डिकन्स्ट्रक्ट कर रहे हैं भाषा के कई लेवल बताते हैं जो अध्यात्म के साथ है वो वो पाया जो है वो तो 
भैरव के साथ ही हाँ परावाक और भैरव एक प्रश्न मेरा वो था जो आपने जन्म वेदी का कहा और और ई का संघट्ट ये होता है फिर उसके तुरंत बाद आपने कहा और और ई भी ई का संघट्ट जो है वो आई होता है आ नॉट नॉट अ आ हाँ आ और बड़ा ई लेकिन ऐसा तो मतलब ग्रामीण नहीं होना चाहिए और ई मिल के ए होता है गुण और ई मिल करके और और ए मिल करके तो नहीं होता आप आकार और आकार बोलिए तो मैं समझूंगी ठीक है आकार हम्म आकार और रस्तोंकार मिल करके ए होता है ए हो गया और अनुत्तर है और ई निवर्ष हाँ उससे ए बनता है हाँ तो ये तो ठीक है उनकी उनकी दृष्टि से उनकी सिस्टम में भी ठीक है हाँ और हम भैया करों के यहाँ भी ठीक है आदेश आदेश बना से ठीक है लेकिन आकार और दीर्घ ई का हाँ मिल करके आई ये कैसे बना रहे मतलब ये रोमांटिकली थोड़ा अच्छा फिर कहीं ऐसा तो नहीं है कि वहाँ आ और ए मिल करके नहीं बनता अब वही मैं आपसे कह रही ह ए मिल कर के फिर आई बन रहा होगा क्योंकि आनंद से बार बार टकराता है पंद्रह व्याकरण का बहुत ज़्यादा वो पास है बिल्कुल I don't think he's being too strict about his Sunday so so let me just comment that that this they are so so much particular about the grammar these शैव दर्शनिका well this etymology is 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 clearly creative to express their ideas and the the actual derivation of the word bhairava is from bhiru, yes, right, with a tadita affix. So a bhiru is someone who's afraid, and uh, a bhaira, bhairava is somehow related to someone who's afraid. So maybe somebody who writes fear into those who are afraid, which is the first interpretation. Which is the first interpretation even in the Vijnana bhairava. Yes, another grammarian at the end of the table here. I think okay. let me let him let this uh, grammarian speak. Sir, अब नात्यानी जी आपको वो क्या है ऑर्डिनेशन। I have just two questions. यानी ये फॉर्म है शंदस मात्री का स्टीम का ऑर्डिनेशन आर। स्टीम सो आह देर इस टी चहल साहब चहल साहब देर इस टी after this. <laughs> yes, Matrika Chakra. Yeah, what is the termination in Matrika Chakra? Termination that is KCD. Yes, I think it's the Prathama. Prathama, Prathama Ek Vajan, Matrika Chakra. मात्रिका चक्रा इधर इधर वर्ड इन न्यूटन क्यों नहीं है हाँ एक वसन दो प्रथम प्रथम विभाग क्या है चक्रम इस इसे हो सकता होना चाहिए मात्रिका चक्रम अधिष्ठान और इनमें भी मात्रिका चक्रे और भी अधिष्ठान आई थिंक ये दिस आई थिंक एनालाइजिंग द कंपाउंड मात्रिका चक्र चक्रा अधिष्ठान I will have to check the uh, the text. I will have to check the Shiva Sutra text mm. because it is not Matrika. right in my head. Yes. Mm. Okay. Yes. 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 ये स्लाइड में से एक टेक निकाल एक स्लाइड निकाल मात्र का चक्र आदिश्तान आदिश्तान मात्र का चक्र आदिश्तान चक्र आदिश्तान स्लाइड यहाँ से भी हमको दिखा सकते हैं ये फिर बैक फिर बैक यस सर अंकल जी मैंने कहा कि जब कश्मीर से लड़ने का मामला आता है, तो फिलासफी में है, बहुत सारे लोगों की कोई अलग-अलग राय है, ये फैसिलिटी तो है, बहुत अजीब सा विर
ஈர்க்க பிராக்டிஷ்னர் So for me, it doesn't matter where they borrow from. And you are right, of course, their Purv Pakshis are um, Buddhist. And within the Buddhism, there are so many derivations that they... And also before that, Vayakarani is our uh, great scholar here, Ritwan uh, Balaramji is there. And he knows from all, where all they have borrowed. So you are certainly right, I agree. But this doesn't matter to me as a practitioner or as an... Um, person who is trying to understand well let me come in let me come in here that i think uh, alka has done an excellent service to those who approach this massive body of literature i mean uh, i have many of these books on my bookshelf it's a it's a whole book case full of a literature and and what she seems to have done here is is to look at uh this from with a bird's eye view and 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 show the relationships between the texts historically i it is obviously within the sampradaya kind of a point of view rather than a following point of view or responding to others and uh, i think many of the scholars who have written about tantras because their great knowledge sometimes are too detailed for for someone who knows little about it like i can do i don't and uh and and i i felt a great service by getting the overview getting the relationship and she seems to have a very sharp insight into the whole uh to, uh, to summarize the contributions of different authors at different stages in the history of the development of this tradition. Uh, I think we can all thank uh, Alka for, for, for this work that she's producing to give a, uh, an entryway. Are there some other questions? Yes. Uh, yes, down towards the end. I've been waiting patiently. காலி <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Sharmila. See, you know, the, every Bhairava has his Shakti, has his Shakti consort. And in the discourse, sometimes we privilege the Shakti, like Kali, Kala Sankarshi, for instance, in this case, sometimes we privilege the masculine aspect. and the bhairavas you are asking about you know kala bhairava in particular he he is the one who is the bhairava of the time itself because kala again is the universe kala is related to universe because in supreme consciousness there is no sequence kala is sequence kala is a, a sequence moment to moment kshana ka jo kram uh, hai sequence of time is itself is universe and universe manifests out of the supreme consciousness and the name given to this the that aspect of consciousness which does the uh, sequencing of time is kala bhairava so the same consciousness takes different aspects the same consciousness is recognized in with so many aspects for example you know there are 50 bhairavas in the uh, every letter of the word uh, denotes a bhairava for instance 
यू नो अनबी डिपॉजिटेड न्यास पद्धति में पूरे बॉडी पर भैरव को डिपॉजिट किया जाता है तो हर हर पार्ट के लिए एक भैरव है तो वो डिनोटेशन के हिसाब से उसकी शक्ति भी है वैसा ही फिर मालिनी चक्र का न्यास भी करते हैं फेमिन एनर्जीज का न्यास भी बॉडी पर होता है तो काल भैरव इज सर्टनली द भैरव ऑफ टाइम दैट डिनोट टाइम दैट मीन्स द यूनिवर्स इट सेल्फ तो संसार जो है वो टाइम की ही वजह से है टाइम को हटा दो तो संसार नहीं है आई होप आई आंसर and uh, to some extent you are embracing i also thought along uh, the line along the lines uh, pankaj ji has expressed bit of a uh, some bit of problem if you have i call it problem that may not be the problem of the presenter of the receiver because we see things according to our own <laughs> Communications and all that. We are very deliberate on that. I would love to see this project as an adhyan project and not merely a sadhana project. Because I I see uh, in, the, in the earlier presentation also I raised this question. Because you see sadhana and adhyan, and uh, that is where I think uh, some bit of. Uh, Some bit of effort is required, maybe required, from your part to make it uh, more comprehensible to people like us. But why I'm raising this question? Uh, Pankaj ji has talked about one way of looking at it that you can pose this as a problem-centric kind of understanding. That may not be the only way of looking. But that can that can be uh, one way of looking at it. This question will keep haunting you wherever you go. That science, how far it is scientific and how far it is beyond science. And merely by saying that unminding, uh, you call for unminding the mind. As a necessary prerequisite for this kind of understanding, this kind of tradition may not be enough. I am saying this because there have been efforts by people like Osho and others to make it understandable, even going beyond mind, sure. dropping the mind, and still it makes some sense to you. And that is where I think people like. Uh, uh, Osho or Rajnis make certain kind of relevance and certain make certain kind of connection. Merely by saying that, as Peter has said, that 98 percent uh, is is black matter or, or unknown thing. And at one point of your presentation, you said that that is what is supreme consciousness or that sort of this kind of thing gives you gives you a kind of advantage. <laughs> And I think uh, that makes the entire project somewhat, uh, 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 somewhat meaningful only to the insiders who understand this thing and tradition and everything, linguistic and all kind of things. It makes sense to them. But if you want to reach out to uh, people beyond that uh, circle. Then you may have to bring in some uh, some concerns, or at least uh, you, you should try to uh, make a certain kind of connections as others have done. If, if that will make a, if, 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 if that may make it somewhat uh, more useful to people like us. But I enjoyed uh, listening to you, and you presented it beautifully. 
Thank you, Hitendri. Uh, it's a, it is an extremely relevant point that you are raising, and that is my effort. I am really coming to this subject academically only um, since four years now. Before that, my whole focus was the on the other side. However, I must tell you that if you look at the work, you know that I have done because here I could only present these selections. You know, I have reduced it to one third or one fourth of what I have done. That exactly is the effort in, you know, that booklet that I have bound together to make it very accessible. And at every point, I have written so many footnotes. So there are explanations for every term source which has been consulted. So kindly at least have a look uh, at the work that I have done. And I take your point, uh, like, you know, uh, with great respect that at some point later, maybe I'll do away with all uh, technical terminology. And uh, if I generate those powers like o Osho, then I'll do away with all Sanskrit terminology and try to make it accessible in uh, our own languages, like Hindi or uh, which language, if it is possible, if I gain that power. Right now, it is beyond my power to, you know, explain without the help of the terms. Like Prakasha says so much, light cannot say anything. Light is not enough in translation. Vimarshan says so much, cognition can't say that. So I'm really sorry, but please look, uh, take a look at the work and there is, it's replete with footnotes because the explanation no, and maybe, maybe, yeah. No, I'm not saying, I, I think it's, it's too, too, too. let me just interject here. I, I think that, uh, you know, there are different, different uh, degrees of making something available to the public and it depends on what public, you know, there's general public who, is not familiar with the literature at all, not familiar with philosophical concepts at all. That's one approach that, that many of the great teachers, modern teachers of India have taken. And I think maybe you're asking her to do more of that kind of thing. But that's that's one kind of approach. But another kind of approach is is the approach which I think Alka has taken, which is to to give us a, a way into the literature of the tantric tradition that describes these things. And and that's something which I think she has done. It's a, it's a different sort of approach. There are different approaches. And I think your request for that approach is legitimate, but uh, there are only so many things one can do at one time. And maybe at some time she'll, <laughs> she'll consider making a more uh, an approach uh, making these concepts uh, somehow explicable and understandable to uh, the public that is not interested in stepping into the literature is just interested in understanding the concepts. And I think that's a different thing than what she's doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may, may I just narrate a personal experience uh, yeah. of the importance of text? The importance of text. Uh, no, I wrote uh, an epic poem in Hindi based on Mahabharata, and the characters are Yudhishthir and Robin. I wrote, uh, I, I completed uh, a number of sargas without reading anything. Dharma, Earth, Town. When it came to books, I couldn't write a line. And I asked a Hindi professor of Delhi University, a Punjabi Hindi professor of Delhi University, Professor Tarek Nath Bhai, and he advised me to read uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutra. And I read it and I completed my last sutra. Wow. 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 So <laughs> wonderful. We must listen. Yeah, we have a question back here. Oh. Oh, Suggestion is also a question. Uh, see, obviously, this whole thing is in uh, makes sense in a tradition which is conceptualizing the ultimate reality and comprehending ultimate reality. Uh, it may be useful for most of us lay persons if you can situate. The Kashmiri Shaivite conceptualization of 
the ultimate reality. Within the Indian tradition now, the various gods, whether it is Brahman or Sarvam, Nirvam, whatever, mm. subsequent. Obviously, mm. this is situated within the tradition. Now, how do we, uh, where does it stand in that tradition? An introduction of that kind will help us situate this particular thing. Uh, being the what do you one question. See, if you look at conceptualization of whatever God or absolute or supreme, whatever you call it, uh, even around the 10th century or 8th century, Alternatives were available. Uh, you had this advocated tradition of conceptualizing the absolute. Uh, you had the Bhakti tradition of conceptualizing the absolute, combination of sense with the doctrine. Why did they choose the Bhaya Bhairava aspect instead of this Adashiva or other forms? Both benign forms of Godhead as the starting point of conceptualization of the Supreme. Mm. So, this actually problem interests me because if I read, say, the Bhakti literature, it is very clear they don't look at God as some complicated person, which have to go through all this. <laughs> so, there is a perfect nearness to God. The Sotamela and God. Have a conversation with each other, very intimate conversation, and then perfectly happy conversations with each other. So there is one conceptualization of God like that, and there is not other. Mm. So, what is the importance of this? Mm. I'm not saying it's good or bad, mm. but what does it add to our understanding of the world? Mm. Mm. Uh, another related issue. Uh, I would like to answer this okay, question. Okay, this mm. Maybe that's this one. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Subhuji. Uh, in your question is also your answer. This tradition is a completely non-dual tradition. In Bhakti also, we uh, conceptualize a Dwaita between us and the God. The fact that the and by the way, this is not only the uh, the Bhirunam uh, um, uh, or Bhayat Sarvam Ravayati, it is also the Vijnana Rupa. So, that, so everything, the, the terrible in the universe is also that Shiva. Because they want to prove their non-dualism. There is no other. So what we see as individual beings in the world, which is dirty, pure, impure, all these concepts, conceptualizations are of the limited empirical individual at that level you know that is why they they bring in this terrible non-terrible and i mentioned this that in tantra loka finally there is no there is no uh, distinction between transcendence and Im immanence is everything and every being and every situation and every principle and every object so he, there is a problem there. If you mm -hmm. allow me, and if you, please, please. The problem is uh, if you conceptualize the ultimate reality as non-dual, uh -huh. non-dual becomes inner. Okay? It becomes active. It becomes active only when it dualizes itself, not huh? Shakti or whatever you call it. Huh? There are various forms of dualizing yourself to language, to power, mm -hmm. to action. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, so dualism is inherent in that conceptualization. It's not like the Advait. There is a dualism is central to this conceptualization of the uh, supreme reality. Mm. So, what the. Uh, yes, well, I do want to say. I, I'd like to say that uh, mm. yeah, I think the, 
is a big difference between bhakti and the Shaiva tradition and the Vedantic traditions in this non dual Advaita Vedantic traditions. Mm -hmm. That the ultimate reality is, is unifying. So the bhakti may be at a manifest stage and it's recognized at a manifest stage in this tradition also. Yes, yes. But uh, this is a this is a complex topic that perhaps we can continue to discuss it after. Let's take one more question and then wrap up because it's now already ten after five. You had a question and then we're waiting for some time. If you can pose that briefly. He's coming front actually. You have mentioned in the and the second question is during the course of your presentation, I was constantly reminded about the idea of uh, not yogis and esoteric knowledge. Mm -hmm. I could piece together the connection mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. So, since you are a practitioner yourself of yoga and you are you know, these texts, would you please tell me why those uh, the Nath yogis? Yeah, the Nath yogis. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, I, I see them as preceding. Uh, Hmm. These texts and this knowledge as, hmm. and these practitioners as preceding uh, to the nouns. Hmm. So the first question uh, first about the Jivan Mukti. By the way, in Yoga Vashisht, uh, Jivan Mukti is conceptualized exactly as it is conceptualized here. That within the body also you can uh, experience that uh, expansive consciousness. Uh, but here, Jivan Mukti is a very, a very uh, complex idea. First of all, they don't believe, being non doers they don't believe that there is difference between moksha and Jivan itself. Because the Jivan, the, that life that uh, an individual, empirical individual is living, it is also graced. Like he, he, the joy itself is like Shiva is experiencing the joy in your uh, limited aspect. So if I am also Shiva through me, uh, through me that supreme consciousness enjoys the uh, the joy of being me. So just as a father enjoys when the little child uh, is uh, prattling, the father also starts prattling with that child. Doesn't know, mean that father doesn't know the language. So the supreme consciousness limits by its own free will. And then enjoys that these limited aspects of its own self. So it's taking joy in its own self. So Jivan Mukti only because discursively we have to denote something. So it's a situation not uh, as Jivan Mukti in Advait Vedanta, for example, where you can only become a Jivan Mukta when you have completely uh, kind of denied the samsara, then you become the that supreme Brahman. But here, Jivan Mukti is not that. Here, once you have uh, like recognized, I am Shiva, you are Jivan Mukta. So uh, that is called Videha Mukti. Uh, when the body is dropped, then then there is more expansiveness. So about the Natha Yogis, you know, I haven't uh, read uh, their tradition, but uh, certainly there are tantric traditions, and they represent the precursors of the Kashmir. Uh, uh, evolve, Kashmiri evolved with Trika, Trika. Because mm -hmm. what these masters from 9th to 11th century are doing, they are doing exactly that. that these esoteric and dis, uh, dispersed practices are uh, taken from the tan tantras and placed in the consciousness. As Balaramji mentioned, that they are really brilliant and capable of doing this, that they can explain everything in terms of the uh, that this is here, this is in your own consciousness. So Natha Yogi, whatever he practices, he is also Shiva. And then he explains it that it is within you, even his ritual, his ritual, for instance, in Kula Yaga, the erotic worship, it is important to have sex with a duty on a certain parv. Now Abhinav Guptacharya restricted it to the parvas. Arva means a special sanctified time when you, you have to have that and offer the liquids of uh, union to the deity. But then he makes it, places it in the consciousness. 
that is the what the acharyas did later and that is so the marvel of this philosophy mentions when koraknath mentions the different chakras in the book ah exactly she's thank you i mean just make two points on this i think we had to take that as the last question and we can continue the discussion over the tea cuz it's now a quarter after 5 you forgive putting a damper on this very interesting topic but uh, i just want to make two points one one is this idea that uh, that jeevan mukti is only uh only uh, after dropping the body this has been opposed since a very early time you know even in the bhagavad gita chapter 4 you know lord krishna dispenses with that idea saying you know it's not a sanyasi is not just one yeah. who has given up act, act, activity yeah. not one who is without action and without mm. fire sure. and uh and so that's uh, quite a quite an old idea mm. it's not necessarily originated in mm. the tradition mm. and uh, bhagavad gita is, is one of the three true, true. bases of vedanta the other point is that um uh making things meaningful by de- by depositing them in consciousness is, is an essential point that the, to recognize that what we consider activity uh just for activity is the activity has whatever uh specific effects it has but taking that activity somehow and depositing it in consciousness is an essential aspect of this all of these shaiva yeah. yes uh, uh of traditions mm-hmm. and that's uh, crucial because because they consider everything to be within consciousness sure. and consciousness within everything this is the and this also is not something which originates with the uh very shy guys it goes back to very ancient thing mm. and i was reminded as the first thing uh, oh uh, this is a question that uh 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 purna mada this verse purna mada purna meda yeah purna meda purna purna dachche purna si purna maya purna meva shishi so the fullness arises from fullness or what are you that you say yes and taking the fullness from fullness still fullness remains remains yeah that's the beautiful this is this is a this is a verse which captures i think the expansiveness of consciousness and the consciousness creating the uh the uh creation which is the out of consciousness or sometimes the in consciousness doesn't separate itself from consciousness well let's uh close the discussion here and continue the discussion at the team so if uh last question you had you said that we had a lot of last questions i think we okay. finished let's let's uh, discuss it over tea and yes all. we will and, discuss uh, that's a very good very, point thank you very interesting topic and I'm very mm-hmm. glad that everyone was interested in participating. Mm-hmm. Thank you Peter G for sharing uh, really sharing. yeah Thank wonderful <laughs> and a very good note on Purna Madaha. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Lavanya ji bye. हां अच्छा इंग्लिश में ठीक है थैंक यू राजू सर थैंक यू फॉर बीइंग देयर सर हेलो राजू सर ये तो अभी चले गए हैं शायद थैंक यू सो मच ओके उसको उसको छोटा